Oops. What is up, my friends? Welcome to another episode of Those Cast. Mira naam hai Vinamur Kisana. If you're new to our YouTube channel, please subscribe because we release new episodes every Tuesday and Friday at 12 p.m. Indian Standard Time. If you're listening to our podcast on an audio platform, make sure you give us five star because we're the best in India. Today's guest is Arjun Sagar Gupta, owner and founder and CEO of uh, the Piano Man Cafes. जिसकी दो लोकेशन हैं वन इन सफदर जंग एंड वन इन गुड़गांव इट्स एन अमेजिंग म्यूजिक वेन्यू इन डेली प्रॉब्लली दी ओनली वन ऑफ इट्स काइंड एंड रन लाइक अ ग्रेट टाइट वेन यू शुड इन दिस पॉडकास्ट वी टॉक्ट अबाउट द इंट्रिकसीज ऑफ रनिंग अ म्यूजिक वेन यू जैज इन इंडिया हाउ लाइव एक्स कैन बी बेटर एंड वट हैपन्स वन अ जैज लेजेंड विद इट्स योर वेन यू द एपिसोड विद अर्जुन सागर गुप्ता ऑफ द पियानो मैन बिग इन थ्री टू वन डू नॉट स्पीक फ्रेंच या सी यू लर्निंग स्पेनिश to ablas español are yaar kya baat hai it is so does this happen because you know several people who come in and they teach you a few phrases no i actually studied french in 2002 at the alliance francaise in and Delhi. then i studied spanish in 2008 at institut espanya so and i don't remember much of either so but you did it out of pure curiosity like you were well french because in school we had the option it was just it was new it was i think started with our batch that mm-hmm. it was the end of school instead of taking hindi as the like i think in the 9th and the 10th we had the option of taking french right which is why i took french and then um spanish was because in 2008 there was a possibility that i would move to mexico for work and uh, hence i studied spanish but that never materialized so What were you doing in 2008 that would propel you to move to Mexico? I was working with a company, uh it was a, a power plant company from South India that was looking at acquiring mining sites in Mexico for coal production and they wanted me to sort of work there. It's 2022 and now you're on a music when or rather yeah, three. It's very different. <laughs> two, so two, third is two. on the way. Right. Pollution delays. Um <laughs> obviously, but I've been to the Piano Man several times. uh and i was saving this compliment so that it sounded fresh when i said it on the podcast it is exceptionally intimate in in the best possible way where a small cheer from the crowd can completely change the environment and and the ambiance in the place and a charismatic musician can completely change it right back yeah. right i don't think you can get that done in a club or like you know often restaurants co- double up as as places where there are also performances but then there's lots of room left uh it's it's a very it's built in a different way i haven't seen well the only time i've seen something like that is maybe like jazz bars in the uk and i was i try to get to the to the blue note in new york but i i had no luck but why did you build piano man no luck as in you couldn't get tickets i couldn't get tickets uh-huh. and then i decided like just to fuck it i'm just going to go back <laughs> yeah no so um the funny thing is that a lot of people assume that i built the piano man based on international clubs but i had only been to one or two when we first opened piano man um the idea was to build a space that focused on the art and the, exactly what you said right most clubs the music is incidental So the idea was that you know we are not a bar that serves music we are a music venue that serves alcohol right that little bit of a psychological shift also in training makes a huge difference to how the space operates with that in mind we sort of that became the baseline right and then over time we sort of developed our sort of intent statement which is you know our purpose is to create a space for the exposure of non commercial western music hmm right because we started as the piano man jazz club but we are not just a jazz club right we have pop rock hip hop r&b funk soul blues um fusion music as well uh, western classical music as well in some of the matinee shows we have uh, folk hindustani music what, as what well. did you say matinee shows Mat- afternoon shows okay um we we do there are days where we have four shows in a day morning afternoon evening night uh and that's a, the entire day is different like you'll have uh you'll have a student recital in the morning followed by a classical recital in the afternoon followed by a comedy show in the evening followed by like a band performing at night it's fun it's the the idea is i mean for me it's always been the one thing the one thing that evokes an emotional response is art right art forces you to sort of face your emotions which is why like artists are in general more in touch with are more aware of their self right um 
everything else in life you can earn money you can be comfortable you can do whatever else you want but to feel you need the expression or the absorption of art right and and i find that's possibly one of the most powerful things in the world and i'm very happy that we're in the space where we are trying to create exposure get more and more people to understand the importance and the significance of it and the the thing that you said about how in an intimate environment uh, a cheer or a you know a statement can sort of mold the environment the disadvantage of that is also that when you're coming from a environment which has become desensitized to performing arts right it's it's not anybody's fault right the big mistake that people make is that and that's why people have disagreements and arguments and sometimes fights and this and that is because it's it's a very black and white understanding of what things should be but that's not the reality the reality is often people their intent is not bad mm-hmm. it's just that they're desensitized right which means they don't know or they haven't had the experience of interacting with live entertainment in the way it's supposed to be done right it's always been ki yaar background mein chal raha hai chalne do theek hai which is also why we started something called the silent song right um i don't know if you when no, did you come? Know, what I, day did you come i've come several times okay yeah. you if you come on any non sunday then if you, if you've not heard the silent song then it means you were outside the club during right after the break ha huh. because the first song after the break is something we call the silent song so that one song we we speak to the band beforehand and all obviously all the local artists are delhi artists and all already know this traveling artists are informed during the sound check we shut the bar we stop service my service team leaves the club i i've been through yeah. that yeah. yeah yeah right and the idea is you know a gaane ke liye for 5 minutes just suspend your lives in you know you forget about social media forget about this forget about that this stems from the first time we did it actually stemmed from frustration right because we had a phenomenal band performing um but the audience was very noisy and i kind of kept requesting kept requesting everyone to sort of take it down a notch but it wasn't happening and again it like i said i don't in, i it's it's not a black or white situation right you have to understand people's perspective so i just got on the mic i requested the band for a minute i got on the mic and i said listen guys the artists that are in front of you right now have a collective i think it was deviana on stage and anyway, it was collective like 120 years of you know 30 40 years per person of professional performing experience so i said that's 120 years of performing experience right in front of you like right now mm. it's not a joke right they're here to play for you whether you listen to them or not they're professionals they're doing their job but what if we give them like 5 minutes one song and for 5 minutes you just pretended like nothing existed around you and you just focused on the music mm-hmm. my only promise to you is that that will be an experience that you won't forget like that's the experience that you'll take home with you this night so you know please please give me these 5 minutes please give them these 5 minutes and it worked and the set after that was 10% of the volume of the set before that <laughs> like because it just you know there's this emotional and psychological switch that went off in people's heads that holy shit okay that made that did make a difference like the music is amazing right so we do this now we we've, we've sort of institutionalized this process we call mm-hmm. it the silent song and we do it every night and every night like there's somebody trained to speak the words that are necessary to pull the audience into the music for just a few minutes and it's a slow process man it'll take months years decades but every day if a few people shift perspective a little bit and they're like what oh, that really did make a difference because mm-hmm. when i paid attention it it hit me somewhere mm-hmm. it hit me somewhere it hit my mind it hit my heart it hit me somewhere a few people a day it's enough i mean that's impact right we have the opportunity to make a little bit of an impact what more can we ask for why do you think people are desensitized to live acts and and i say that um mostly because um what what's up all this 
all this or oh, the devices everything uh, yeah. but i wanted it's to life. say yeah i wanted to say that what is interesting about the piano man is that all the seats face the stage which is something you would see yeah. in a comedy venue right now in a typical restro bar you could even be the artist could be in the back like some venues just they're behind you and so you can choose to tune in as and when you please depending on how many drinks you've had do a vava and then pay patronage should you desire and then go about your way are you do repeat audiences come and then are they used to like are they more perceptive to to the sounds and and the music um and what's like a tough audience to deal with okay do repeat audiences come we actually have a fairly good repeat rate right mm-hmm. because people who really love to interact with music do end up coming to us often are they more perceptive well they're obviously there because they enjoy the environment and the music mm-hmm. at the same time we also seeing over as as we become an older venue in the sense as the longer we are around our there's a newer sort of audience also coming in like a whole different um socio economic background um people who would not ordinarily walk into a music venue right but now we've been around long enough for them to be curious about it yeah so you, like, yeah right outside there's also lots of skateboarders yeah is, oh, that's actually that's veg non veg the yeah. shoe store yeah yeah yeah, yeah but, but but they're always in so you kind of get primed for going to piano man <laughs> that whole block is just yeah no yeah. that's just uh, that's just to help people with the last mile transportation <laughs> <laughs> just jump on a skateboard and slide in so uh, what what about the balcony boxes cuz that's something that i notice is maybe like a part of opera theaters and and stuff so the intent of vertical integration of seating if, across our venues including the new one that's coming up is um actually just the the simple intent is to reduce line of sight distance the closer you are to the stage because if i make large horizontal rooms right then you go further back and further back and further back and further back mm-hmm. so it comes from there and also to create see uh the immersion of senses is very important right if i'm trying to dislocate you from where you are i want you to disconnect with the day that you've had and i want you to have just an incredible experience like just be able to enjoy yourself regardless of you know for that to happen uh, we have to be able to address all your senses your sight your sound your smell your taste you know everything has to be mm. affected right so the materials that we choose to build our club with the way that we choose to uh, there's a reason why we go so heavily into sort of architectural design it's not simply for the sake of spending money i would rather not i'm gupta ji okay <laughs> but but it's important to build immersive spaces that people can walk in and be all right i've had a shit day but i'm here i'm here to mm-hmm. let it go i'm here to sort of recuperate i'm here to you know rebuild my energies um so all of that comes you know the 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 advantage of these super high ceilings is that it creates this again it's all about immersion about architectural design which is a very important part of building a space which is immersive right why do you build this in the first place did you have a template in india no we didn't we it, it was just a thought <laughs> you you so you this is your career now right you do this full time pretty much yeah yeah you you run the two venues and the third one is coming up yeah You just thought okay let's have a music venue. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And you just went with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it, in in um so it, with a long so my background isn't hospitality. Right. Nor is it well technically music. Like I've studied music as I was at the Delhi School of Music for almost 18 years under my teacher John mm-hmm. Raphael. I did the Fulbright thing in in Boston in 2007. But when i was growing up you know uh, did science and eco in school did my engineering through my engineering years i was working in different sort of fields I experienced a lot of different ideas and fields of work and i loved all of them you know i loved working uh with a as a sales guy for a simulation systems company i equally loved working as you know in international commodity trading i equally 
sort of enjoyed working in a factory on scientific instruments. I equally enjoyed teaching piano. So, you know, for me, because they're all different experiences and they all add to the person that I am today. Um, but uh, when when the, the, the whole food spectrum was never anywhere on my horizon, right? Mm-hmm. I'd never even, like, literally entered a kitchen like most Delhi boys, you know. Mm-hmm. Mummy khana bana hai, ya, yeah. you know, somebody is making sure that you're fed right. and, you know, we're, we are we are entitled, we are privileged to have that, you know, the opportunity to have somebody sort of feeding us and, you know, uh, and it takes us, it, I think it takes a little time to realize that that's a significant privilege, not everyone has that. Right. Um, but in 2010, um, we had some friends who wanted to start a concept you know, they wanted to create a healthy food QSR. Mm-hmm. And they said, okay, the first step to this is while we sort of put the systems in that for that in place, why don't we look at um, setting up a base kitchen, a central kitchen. So we started with like a, a bakery central kitchen. And uh, they're just like, hey, Arjun, you know, we trust you. We know you. Uh, let's do this together. Mm-hmm. And that's how I entered. Like I, I was the, the, the non-leading partner when we started, but they weren't they they weren't based in India, so I had to sort of run operations. And then it wasn't going so well, so they're like, you know, let's just shut it down. Mm-hmm. And I felt that listen, ab koshish karni shuru kari hai, to let's. You also had more skin in the game. You were there, like uh, seeing yeah. it. Yeah. No, I, I to their I mean to their credit, they're incredible people. They would have. I mean, they wouldn't have let me lose anything at that mm-hmm. point of time. But for me, it's also about, you know, hey, this is a new challenge. This is a field I don't know anything about. I'm not ready to let it go yet. Mm-hmm. So I, st- I stuck to it for a while. So 2010, to, you know, we were supplying all across the city. We were supplying to restaurants across the city. It's a base kitchen, right? We're supplying to the sort of big MNCs and stuff. Um, but it was challenging. I, I learned a lot because running a base kitchen is also a little bit like, you know, it's not a retail business. So mm-hmm. The added strain on top of everything else is people aren't paying their bills. Right. Um, eventually, we had the opportunity to take over a cafe that we were in conversation with to supply goods to. So, but that came with Kavits. Uh, first one being no meat allowed, second one being no alcohol allowed because landlords. So, um, so I, I, I sat down with my father and I said, kya, kya like, what, what do I do? So dad's like, you know, treat this like your fire test. Mm-hmm. If you can make a non-alcoholic, non... Meat place. N- like a vegetarian, non-alcoholic jazz cafe, <laughs> successful, then you stay in this business. Otherwise, you go looking for a job again. I was like, well, fair point. <laughs> you know? So that's how I, um, so we, we took that space and then um, we had some really bad ideas for names, like really bad ideas for names right up to like a month before launching. Oh. Um, the leading contender was the Good Life Cafe. Um, some really bad ideas for names. And um, just one day, like my brother was in town. My brother doesn't live in India. He's in the States. He was in town. My sister-in-law was there. Um, and... This is, I, th- I think this is around the time they got, yeah, this is right after they got married, right, 2012. And uh, I'm, I'm sitting in my, uh, we're sitting in my living room, I was just doodling on the piano. Everyone, the whole family is like, mom, dad, everyone's there. And uh, dad's like, why don't you just call it like the, I think dad said it, why don't you just call it the piano man? And it's one of those, you know, oh, that, that sounds interesting. A lot of people assume I call it the piano man because I play the piano. That's not the reason right. why it's called the piano man. In my head, it was like, oh, it's an ode to the pianist that I love. So that's why when you walk into the club, the first thing that you see on the all over, like in in Delhi, on the brick walls, we've etched the names of. I was going to say Charlie Parker. Actually, actually, the first name in all our clubs technically is Art Tatum, who is like okay. my favorite m- musician of all time. Even Gurgaon, when you enter, you've got that big brass plate on the floor, uh-huh. embedded into the floor, and that's got all the names etched in it. Wonderful. So, yeah. I was, well, I was one of the nights when uh, people were performing, and I was just sitting there on a table enjoying my several drinks, and I was like, this is just the good life, and I turned to the right, as you often do when you see exposed brick, just to, yeah. you know, like, kind of get a feel. And it said Charlie Parker. 
ना द स्टोरी अबाउट चार्ली पाकर इज दैट की मैंने वो देखी हुई है विप्लैश अच्छा मैंने नहीं देखी है अच्छा यू हैव नॉट वॉचड विप्लैश तो मैंने विप्लैश देखी है आई वाज लाइक ओ माय गॉड दिस इज दैट बिकॉज़ द टिरानिकल ड्रमर ड्रम टीचर इन दैट सेस चार्ली पाकर डिडंट बिकम चार्ली पाकर इफ हिज टीचर डिडंट लाइक यू नो थ्रो अ ड्रम स्टिक एट हिम और अ ड्रम समथिंग अबाउट दैट एंड देन आई रियलाइज एक्चुअली हैव लाइक चेकड आउट चार्ली पाकर एंड व्हाट्स द अदर गाय चैट बेकर एंड ऑल ऑफ दीस गाइस एंड मेड ऑल मैं फिर आगे जा नहीं पाया बिकॉज़ इट वाज like people were sitting there i couldn't like manually inspect all the bricks uh-huh. just to see who was uh, mentioned there but that was very cool because it's like you come in with some existing knowledge of what jazz is and then you find that oh wow this is just being reflected back to me so there is clearly some history to it it isn't just a hack experiment ki chalo jazz bana dete you you clearly have like a foundation in jazz yeah I mean I've been studying and playing it for two decades now. Yeah, but yeah. what I what I also notice uh is that sometimes you you do this thing where you you get people to come in and out when they're jamming and you sort of direct it yourself like a curator would. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting to know that you're having programs from the afternoon till the night. How do you program these things? What do you think ki dopahar ka interesting hoga sham ko kya hoga? So programming is actually something that we it's seven years of experience 7000 shows of experience and it'll keep evolving but the methodology to how we program is something that we it's not arbitrary or random like there is a uh, we, we have a huge database at this point um covid kind of threw our methodology a little off track because it became very difficult to find artists who were willing to perform mm-hmm. for a while um there were no there were no there were no guests coming in either um for a very long period of time but the intent is that <clears throat> there are multiple ways that we look at it it's not linear right so there are uh, when artists write into us we have a sort of methodology to sort of assess whether they're ready for the stage or for our stage right yeah. because that's a decision we can make how does someone yeah. become stage ready is it so interaction very broadly at a you know i i look at three sort of factors i look at the technical musical ability which is uh and as somebody who's been playing music for so long and interacting with music musicians so much i it it's fortunately uh become easier for me to assess these things even through like simple submissions of videos and stuff mm-hmm. the technical musical ability in which i look at both what i perceive the person's theoretical theoretical knowledge to be um and their form on their instrument which will tell me what their Uh, uh, experience and technical ability on that instrument is uh, but that isn't everything right because not every phenomenal musician is a trained musician right. so then we look at musicality which is with whatever knowledge that they have what kind of music do they produce you know and musicality then covers those three basic elements of harmony melody and rhythm and then we look at stage craft mm. you know is the person comfortable on stage are they able to handle the stage are they able to interact with audiences because there are phenomenal musicians who don't really know how to behave on stage in the mm-hmm. sense they don't know how to interact with audiences on stage there are incredible people with stage craft who may not be so f- far ahead on their musical journey as somebody else right so it's it's a delicate balance of these three things and we have um you know some of the most incredible jazz musicians in the country um are not very stage craft savvy right right is it because they have less playing time because who really hosts them at this point at least in delhi you can't say that okay <laughs> like <laughs> i mean we are we are we are pushing out 30 32 events a week whoa at a, at a minimum you get sleep bro yeah uh-huh. i i i actually, I've, i've started changing my lifestyle a little bit now because i'm getting older and okay. these things are catching up because since i was like since for for a, a bit, the better part of 20 years i've been uh, operating on just hours a day of sleep um and for a very long time like holidays were not in my dictionary and you know time off was not in my dictionary now i'm just like you know theek hai a little bit of balance though I still don't really feel the need for it like I'm happy right right uh, with my team I try to um I will have to validate with them <laughs> but you know there's like for example now we're trying to push this you know turn off post work like forced thing mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. that only respond to emergencies otherwise just respond in the morning when you come to work yeah because staying always on is not good for most people yeah yeah um so so programming coming back to programming right so um it's it's not that we have morning to night events every day we do have two events a day in in all our spaces we have 7 like, days a week yeah 7 days a week okay. so but we've simplified that for ourselves to some extent uh mostly in the afternoons we have retained artists mm-hmm. right so it's a solo set because the afternoon the focus is not on the stage and like we tell the people musicians people come in on say a wednesday afternoon it's completely random i'll be completely uh-huh. honest like there are good days and uh-huh. mostly there are maybe one or two people yeah right because we're not known right now as a lunch space we're known right. as a the, the monica club brings its own disadvantages with it uh there are great days as well like weekends and all we actually do pretty well in the afternoon like yeah. a lot of people do come but during the weekdays it's still a little tricky and what happens because i would i mean i'm on this weird diet right now so i'm not drinking but if i can just barge in on a like a saturday afternoon and i have time and i'd much rather be in the company of music then go and sit somewhere at an open air place and drink some alcohol and look at other couples as they date and i just want to enjoy the music that sounds a little creepy no what i mean <laughs> <laughs> look at other couples as they date i have my uh, specific <laughs> magnifying glasses um but what i mean to say is those places aren't the most uh conducive for if you want like a intense immersive experience yeah. and you want to couple that with alcohol yeah. you can't have that at like a, an open air restaurant where people mm. sit face to face because if you drink by yourself but well, you can do that at piano yeah. man you can actually go and just sit by yourself have a drink and watch the music yeah. so if i go in on a saturday an afternoon right will i be so drinks yeah, i mean that's your choice okay. bars open okay right um a lot of people that come in on the weekend afternoons like for example in especially in the gurgaon property a lot of families come in on the weekend afternoons okay right so they'll they'll be there they want and we we always tell the artists for the afternoon this specifically so we have a couple of retained artists who play a couple of days a week um that afternoons is not the focus is not the stage the focus is usually like because the people who come out in the afternoon are maybe corporate meetings maybe you know but people, they're having meetings there they, it's the lunch break okay so they'll come out you know in gurgaon especially right the, we're surrounded by like you're in 30 second milestone <clears throat> yeah. yeah so we're surrounded by so they you know a team from google will come down you know for a one hour lunch break so they'll have a bite they usually won't drink if they're coming down for a lunch break but you know they come down in the evening yeah sure they'll have a drink and they'll enjoy a little bit of the music they'll have conversations and then they'll go mm. so it's a it's a different intent except when we specifically program for example theater or a, you know or specifically program a matinee set with a traveling band or a classical performer uh, then we change the environment and we're like okay now it's back to serious listening so, so do you change the seats do you change the lights no we don't change the seats but automatically what happens is uh, when when people are coming in lighting yes when there's a shift to a you know the little little things you know normally if you come in i'll take gurgaon as an example because that's a little more active for lunch mm-hmm. um the back curtains are open and sunlight is streaming in for the afternoon show so it's it's not a dark ninji you know mm-hmm. because even a beautifully designed space in the day when it's cut off from light feels dingy yeah right um so we open up the curtain we have sunlight streaming in we've put a little we put these black sheer curtains to sort of reduce the intensity of the light but at the same time if you're doing a performance performance like a, a showcase performance then we'll sort of shut the curtains we'll shift to our stage lights and make it a performance mm-hmm. yeah so when when you make i was just looking at venues for like doing a small event for our own uh, podcast like a mm-hmm. rebranding launch and i was thinking when i went to different hotels i was trying hotels first i noticed something that events people know like the back of their hand but i did not is that there's different kinds of seating classroom theater cluster conference all of that which i found fascinating mm-hmm. and then If you could would would you ever do like a classroom style or a theater style seating in Piano Man? I mean we have for specific shows. And so mostly So for people for people that's just like seats after the, another correct, seat, right? Correct. Like a line of seats. Yeah, it's just a line of seats. Yeah. Uh this happens usually in two environments. One for workshops. Okay. So when we're doing music workshops then we usually shift to uh theater style seats. Um actually three. Second is when they're poetry slams. Hmm. Then it shifts to theater, theater style seats, and the third is specific comics. Comics insist on theater style seating and not table seating. Hmm. So we 
especially for comedy we prefer not to do it because um our revenue comes from sale right and once you do a theater style seating arrangement yeah. you kind of block fnb sales yeah so how many fires do you have to put out per second um less and less over time um okay. so and that comes down to training teams it comes down to you know more systematic operations it comes down to also being a little less of a control freak which mm. which happens which happens when you understand that the people that you have in your team are also wonderful competent individuals but they have their own way of doing things so then you prescribe your outcome through better systems got it right so you you should have a process flow you should have a defined outcome and let people figure out their own way of approaching it mm. so this is one thing that you know a lot of people told me um for years that So basically I'm an engineer so I love processes systems process. workflow I love it you know it just it yeah. it's it 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 gives me comfort mm-hmm. and a lot of people told me that I'm like what we built is a one hit wonder we'll never be able to replicate it because it's completely dependent on my presence you're the bottleneck I'm the bottleneck right and this usually happens in venues it usually happens in ideas which are tightly controlled by one person right right it could be anything like we're sitting in this podcast yeah so if you aren't conducting this podcast yeah would you trust the would you trust anybody else to run it the way that you would want it to be run the business for sure but just no, the no, specific interview no right yeah so similarly that was my problem with the venue i was always there and i was always the person who took decisions on everything from which diversity liquid is being utilized to clean the floor to which microphone do we purchase yeah. to the calendar to everything right but don't you think if you did not do that then you would not have the exacting standards that you do now no i'm not saying i shouldn't have done that yeah i'm saying that being involved with every aspect of the organization gives me a much better idea of the organization that i'm building right right but there's a time for everything there's a time to figure out then also how to shift these processes to the next level allow my managers and their teams to deal with issues that arise and have an escalation scale so that it's only a specific certain things that are being um sort of brought up the chain to me so this became like this was something that rankled in my head right piano man cannot grow or exist because of me mm. okay exist in my absence or grow because you know, can't grow further because of i'm the bottleneck so then we started working really hard on building processes for everything we're still doing it in fact you know every time we finish one round of process like building structures and putting things into place and we're like okay great now that's like baby's work mm-hmm. let's scrap it and build on top of it and see how much further we can detail. So right now in fact yesterday we were rebeginning the exercise of rewriting all our SOPs. Mm. But now what's happening is that the level of detailing of activities is so so much more refined than 3 years ago that we you know for every department for every sub department we're dividing it into every single activity and then we're then writing codified SOP charts for every single activity it's not become complicated when you are executed because uh, as someone who's also tried to use processes hmm. would it, i mean what i do and what i what you do is very different but um hmm. there's a, you can only have a certain amount of success rate because like h- how much can you factor in in your recipes and then what happens when you write those down and then something dynamic happens that you haven't accounted for yes absolutely so how much can you incorporate increases with every iteration and all these dynamic unexpected curve balls get incorporated into the future iterations so someone is out there say something happens every time something new happens incident reports are to be written to capture what this new problem is yeah and then we sit down my senior management team and i sit down and try to proceduralize it how would this be addressed in a and obviously in any live environment there will be things which can't completely be captured or the same thing might present a new head but the purpose is see 
to say that it's difficult to execute a system or to say that um, everything can't be captured, so what's the point, defeats the purpose of building systems, right? Because the idea is, if you think that, if you sit down once and define things, it'll be done. It's never going to work that way. Hmm. We just went through a black swan, right? Was any of us prepared for it? No. Nope. Right? So, um, the approach always has to be dynamic from our perspective as well. Hmm. So, hey, this is what I know to date. So, let me capture that. Right? Getting your teams to follow systems is another task. Hmm. Obviously. Because it's easier not to. Right. It's a slow process. I mean, the only way to get your teams to follow a system is to ensure that, for example, I, 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 with my events team, this is something very simple that I say, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Because events teams are used to just taking decisions on phone calls. Right, right. right? It's, it's very chaotic. As someone who's worked yeah. in events, it's... it's I have a very maddening. simple rule. Mm. If it's not on mail, it didn't happen. Mm. So now if an artist calls me and says that, you know, somebody from your team said this. I'm like, okay, no problem. I go to the person and I say, what is the last documented email? And I'll do whatever that email says. Right? At the same time, also understanding that many artists don't reply on, on mails, we keep trying to encourage them. Please, mm. please, please. Please send your invoices. Please send your invoices on time. Right? So now we're like, okay, we're going to be clearing invoices twice a month between these dates and these dates. Whatever invoices are in will be cleared. Right. No questions asked. They'll be cleared. So, bhejo. Jaldi bhejo. You know, and getting artists to start sending invoices is also a task. Right? Was a task. Most people are on. Yeah. Like, we're, we're, yeah, we're working completely on, I mean, for many years now, completely on invoice payments. Right? And the idea is also like a lot of artists will say, but TDS katega. And that conversation I've had with many artists over the years. So, Kato? They could GST lagao, upar, or TDS niche. But understand that this is how you're also building your credit lines and wealth. Correct. You have to have documented income. You have to be a tax paying citizen of the company, of the country at some point. Yeah. Right? Because if you need, if you need to grow in life, you need to take credit to build, to buy instruments, houses, cars. You need to, you want to start a business, you want to start a school. Where will you get that financing from, right? You sh if you don't have any income to show. So we've been trying to encourage people to sort of formalize their. So it's process, processified to the max. Uh, uh, ultimate no, sophistication. Obviously, obviously not. I mean, no, I make what, it sound what, like. What, what I'm trying to say that. No, it's, it's, it's great. You have that. Then without generalizing, a lot of artists. Uh, let's just say aren't type A people you know where like you wake up in the morning 9am or huh. for invoice yeah. I mean I do that and whenever I work with artists I've had these difficulties yeah. and I also consider myself an artist but, but, but now what we do is we'll keep chasing them please send please so sometimes we'll get like you know multiple shows across three months and we get an invoice today mm -hmm. for all those shows we're like no problem again I invoice so huh. we'll just clear it great so just get people into the habit. And then there are a couple of artists who know Kiar, who've been playing with us for a while. They know Kiar, Piano Man's the payment ani ani hai. Like right. I'm, there's no two ways about it for me, right? Right. So TK, they kind of treat it like a bank. Like they'll, they won't bill us because they're saving up to buy like a specific thing. Yeah. You know, I want to buy a new symbol. Uh -huh. Okay. And one, like one specific drummer told me this also. Yeah, I want to buy it. So you, I'll just wait till I have enough money accrued and then I'll invoice you once and buy that. Wonderful. You know? So I'm like, fine, but I we keep encouraging people to please bill us on time because then yeah. our cash flows become haywire if you have to make like yeah. random large payments, you know, unscheduled large payments. So I'm like, yeah, please, flow me <laughs> I mean, I, and then I also see that you yourself played the trumpet or I believe the saxophone. I'm trumpet, sorry, if I, you, you played the trumpet a few times that I visited. You're also doing that and you're doing this extremely savvy business stuff at the same time. Savvy is a big word. I, I think we're also just trying to figure things out, right? Um, it, the difference is that we've also seen the mortality rate of both restaurants and furthermore music venues in India. And we don't want to be a statistic. 
right? We 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 don't want to be a statistic. Right. We want to be we want to be something that had some impact in its lifetime. So that's why we are approaching things from this professional perspective. And a lot of how I talk today and how I think today is also credited to sort of one person who came on board a couple of years ago, Dr. Pradeep Banerjee. From he lives in Bangalore. He's an IIM professor. So he started coming and consulting with us and helping us. It's like my executive MBA man, like understanding how to work. You know, ex Tata head. You know, incredible amount of experience, professor. Uh, and you know, when I first started sitting down with him, everything was theoretical. And I would just be banging my head against the wall, saying, "Ki sir, I will do so much theory. How will I implement it? Uh. And he's just like, "Listen, shut up." <laughs> you know, <laughs> he's a very polite man, and a very, very sort of his his ethics and his um, methodology are immaculate. Right. So over time, it just it was just a switch one day, two years in, when I was just like, "Oh wait, I see how a completely theoretical system can be." practically implemented and and then so on and so forth and then we sort of then my my teams are current so all my senior management team most of our operation side of the team have been with me for 8 10 years like since we started right right so now they are also reaching a point where they are able to function at a phenomenal ideation level And I say this because now we are interviewing people for the new club that's coming up, and the the knowledge base of the manpower that's coming in, and I'm talking about senior management. Mm-hmm. It's it's genuinely disappointing, because the industry is not demanding excellence or training or even knowledge. Are they just demanding people who look authoritarian? Are they just demanding people who are like? It's not even authoritarian. They just they want. Acha, you've worked for five years, so obviously you should be promoted. Okay. You work for seven years now. Obviously, you should get the next. Di- so it's years all, it's spent all about confidence. It's exactly it's it's yeah. it's that Peter principle, right? Yeah. Where you're just promoting people from a position of competency into a position of incompetency. <laughs> they can do one job very well. Uh huh. So you promote them, and then they can do the next job also perhaps very well. So you promote them again, and then you're just like, wait, they've never been trained for the next level. Right. But they're at the next level. So what we are trying to do is now we are stuck because because we started functioning in this manner, our understanding of our own business has improved significantly, but our requirement for manpower has changed. Right, right. Can't have freshers. It's not even about freshers. We can't like I'm interviewing people with 15 years of experience, and I kid you not, my service captains, no more than them. Whoa. you know and again this is a generalization this is not it's not about oh look we have such brilliant people we don't no, none of us are brilliant we're all again at the end of the day we are statistics you know we all have our spaces of competence and our spaces of incompetence you me everybody else mm-hmm. but but for example in our subdrang venue we're actually internally promoting one of our senior well a guy who started with us 8 years ago as a entry level waiter Then became a captain. Then became assistant manager. We're promoting him to run our flagship menu. No, oh. because after all of this, I realized that hey, he understands the ethics of the organization. He understands the intent of the organization. He has a beautiful personality, and you know he is willing to work hard and learn. No ego, just ready to do what's needed to be done to take the responsibility that's required. But can't ask for more. is it is it challenging to train people for the standards that you have um, especially when they're used to like uh, what i'm trying to say is like in the hospitality industry across india do what you require of people is different from what they actually are used to absolutely so a we don't run uh, our you know our organization itself isn't a pure play fnb organization So that becomes the first sort of. So what's a pure player. play F&B organization? Someone just just serves drinks. That's it. Khana, you know. Ha, bas. Ha. You know the entire environment changes. The, when when I like I said, you know, you can also be a place with music, but 
if you're an F and B venue that serves music, it's different from being a music venue that serves F and B. Right. It's it's a, it's not all that subtle, but it is very significant. Right. Right. Um. So that I believe we are fairly unique in that sense. Like, because I've been to, of course, venues across the country. It's different when you go to a theatre. You go to an NCPA. Oh my God, it's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. It's it's a pure play concert hall. I went for Yo Yo Ma just before COVID. Yo Yo Ma played here. Yo Yo Ma played NCPA Bombay. Achha, okay. And I thought in Delhi I was excited. Yeah, I, I listened to his stuff I, on I, 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 Spotify I, focus playlists. He, he got to come, man. He's my God. He's beautiful. Mm. So and it's you know watching him play is another degree of excellence, right? Because he is. I mean, so I walked in, I, I uh, driving from the airport to North Bom- uh, South Bombay, uh, NCPA. Okay. Uh, was a lot longer than I expected. So right, I because you're literally going from uh, Goregaon ke paas air, uh, hai, or waan se fir you have to cross the the bridge and then go. Yeah, it takes a while. I, I don't know Bombay that well. Mm-hmm. In fact, I remember my last one or two visits to Bombay. Maybe not the last one before that, but like 90 minutes. <laughs> Fly now. It's like literally taking, driving down, maybe coming down here to have an, a conversation with you and then going back. You know? Right. But, um, but Yo Yo Ma, uh, I, so I got like a few minutes late, like four or five minutes late. He had just started the, the and he was playing the, the un- unaccompanied Bach Cello Suites, which I love. Okay. And uh, so I missed the first few minutes and I went and I, took my seat and I was I think the first second row but side mein wohi mm-hmm. bachi thi seats when I booked so here's this just extraordinary extraordinary person and I look at his body language and I'm like yaar agar iska student aise bachata ye to usko dandne maarta you know because Yo-Yo Ma has reached a place where he transcends you know acha okay you playing the cello sit on the edge of your seat back right. straight he is lying down in his chair and he is in his eyes are closed and his hands are doing whatever they're doing and the sounds that are coming out are perfection yeah it's beautiful it's beautiful to see the comfort in his body language with the music right he's it's in him like mm. the decades and decades of playing it was beautiful it was really beautiful um yeah so NCP, I was talking about music, like, the, right. yeah, so music, so there's literally in, in India, you've got like a couple of, you've got, in terms of definition, F&B is F&B. F&B ke andar aapka wo non-alcoholic aajayega, alcoholic aajayega, alcoholic ke andar club or restaurant ka technical differentiation nahi hai, to the best of my knowledge, it's just with alcohol, without alcohol, just a license to any and then we bifurcate them based on, you know, what the activity is. Music venues don't have a um, separate framework. Theatres do. Mm-hmm. But a music venue that serves F&B falls under the restaurant license. Okay. And in the long term, that's something that as more and more performing arts spaces, because it shouldn't just be music, it should be performing arts. As more and more performing arts spaces come up, obviously, we we would want to create a framework which suits that methodology and we'll start those conversations at some point we're too small right now to have impact at a governance level what's like a dream artist that you got in piano man and then oh. he just sat there it's like chick korea man chick korea chick korea yes i've, I've heard the name of course in <laughs> yeah. in in a I jazz mean, playlist i never imagined in my life that chick korea would a be in delhi and be at piano man so you just emailed him no, so he was supposed to play, uh, the OML brought him down. Okay. He was supposed to play a different concert, but that got canned like two weeks before the show. And I was a part of the, you know, OML had roped me in as the, organ, you know, the part of the team sort of promoting and pushing out the event. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, when it got canned, I wrote a mail to his, to Chick's management and OML, of course, you know, mm-hmm. because OML's saying that this is canned, but would you be okay playing in a tiny club? Venue. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously management was like, nah, yaar, it's chick and you know, this tiny little club. Um, but, you know, so I wrote a really long reply to that <laughs> saying that, listen, I'm a big you fan. Know, not, it's not about being a big fan. I said like, it's important for the scene. Uh, so, you know, we will at a technical level prepare whatever's required. We will 
we'll go all out. Like, whatever you need, we do. And then after that, chick can walk in and choose not to play. That's my problem. You don't worry about it. Right? If he doesn't like the environment, he can just say, screw it. We'll still have the green room set up. He can chill, eat, drink, be happy and go home. Mm-hmm. No problem. So I wrote this long sort of mail saying that, you know, um, it's, it's significant for Chick to have played in India and in Delhi. So here is how I can contribute to this. How do we make it happen? At that time, I was actually in Israel on a, um, the Ministry of Arts and Culture from Israel had taken a few of us for a arts and culture, this thing. So this whole conversation about the show cancellation, then me writing mails is happening while I'm on bus rides between meetings. And, yeah. and then we come back and I have a mail at like eight in the morning from Chick. Himself? Call me. Phone number. <laughs> like so you know I'm, and I've just woken up it's like 8 o'clock and I'm still like you know I see the mail and I'm a little I'm nervous and uh, I, I, I just immediately and I, this one habit I developed through my life is I can within seconds of waking up I can be this yeah oops on. sorry you can just be I can on, just be on. Yeah. Like, I can be on all the time so I just within a second just shook my head and gave him a call and I'm like you know, Good morning, sir. This is Arjun Gupta. Um, you send a mail. Um, he was in Japan. He was on tour in Japan at that time. Uh, so, and from Japan, he was coming to in India. So we had we had a really we had like a forty five fifty minute long conversation about music, about performing arts, about. And this is something I'm going to say something which I've never said on record. I've told close friends, family, musicians. I, no, we disagreed about certain things, right? We disagreed, yeah. not musically, we disagreed about the relationship between, say, an artist venue and a musician. Because Chick said it's the artist's responsibility to capture the, mu- the audience. Mm-hmm. And, and in my head, I'm like, so in the 50s, 60s, when you started your career, I didn't say this to him, obviously, but I put it across in a different way and not such a wordy way. But in my head, the, the reasoning was, okay, I understand his point. When he started out his career, we didn't have all this. Right. Technology for people it's, who are listening in. Yeah. yeah. And we didn't have the number of distractions that we have today because of technology. Right. We can, like right now we're in a conversation. If cell phones didn't exist, then there would be a landline outside. If there was an emergency, somebody would have to call that number. And right. one of your team members would have to come in and inform us. But right now, I've had maybe 18 missed calls while we're sitting and talking. Let's go. Right? So, I mean, that's distraction, right? Mm-hmm. I've got my like notes open over here. I haven't had to write anything down. But like, mm-hmm. where's the good old paper and pen? <laughs> you know? Mm. So, but this is great. No, I'm, I ne- I'm not dissing technology in any way. Like, our lives are significantly better. It's not, right. it's not the whole conservative, the past was better. No, it isn't. Mm-hmm. We are moving ahead. But what we are not doing is learning how to balance our lives with this technology. Right. So, so, so my point, my thinking behind what I said to Chick Next was, and then by the time this became predominant, starting from the early 2000s, Chick Korea was already Chick Korea. No. no. Nobody in the world connected even remotely to the space of jazz connected to live music, connected, would, would not know the significance of Chick Corea walking into a room. Right. And, and he is, a, I mean, he, he was an f- absolutely phenomenal musician. Like, so m- my thinking was simply this, that but today when a young musician who may have the potential of being as incredible as Chick Corea comes out and steps on a stage, he's playing to a desensitized audience that's on their phone. Yeah. So here is where I feel that it's also the, the, the venue's responsibility for a music venue to figure out a way to just for a second break that concentration from the phone and bring it onto the stage. Hmm. Just, for, just, just a splash. Right? That means awareness that something is happening. This, this is the reason why we have a host every day. Like we host the shows. It's not just the artist getting on stage and performing. Right. You know, somebody will talk them onto the stage. Somebody will talk them off stage. Somebody will talk about them for the silent song. 
it seems insignificant okay kuch bol raha hai it's not there's a there's an intent behind it and the intent is to break you the audience's concentration from whatever you're doing and yeah. pull it to the stage because our first instinct obviously when there's a slight moment of boredom is ki phone check kar lete hain ha aur fir wo hum kya kar rahe hain ki aapka attention ek second ke liye liya humne and we hand it over to the artist right utna hum bolte hain ki hamari responsibility hai uske beyond yes of course you know artist but also keep in mind that it takes time to build stage craft it takes time to build a reputation hmm. so what we where we can help as a venue is also theek hai us journey ko hum kaise support kaise kar sakte hain so kya wo when check came down what happened then no it was just unreal it was unreal did you pack the venue up did people come uh, no, so we didn't announce the show because if we had announced the show it would have been a nightmare like because yeah. it's a small venue so um the people that had booked tickets for the show that was to happen uh-huh were told uh, that the show's canceled and their money was refunded and they were offered free access to this event and i informed musician and i requested omel ki yaar meko thodi si musicians ke liye jagah de do kyunki ye ye unke liye hai matlab ye matlab you know it's an experience that we may not we may not get again yeah and we won't get it again chick passed away you know uh So yeah so first come first service pe they took bookings for for the people who had booked for the show and then they got their refunds and all the show that happened at piano man wasn't charged like mm-hmm. it was free for everyone um oml took that decision uh from for their the things we took that decision in general because oml was coming with, with all the mechanics and the grand piano coming in and this and that it, 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 it i would have maybe been willing to spend any multiplier on the amount that it did eventually cost us because it it was priceless that yeah. experience a so multiple experiences for me i got to host chick korea i got to hear chick korea i got to meet chick korea i got to hang out with chick korea in the green room now sirs everywhere like it, you know bahar baatein kar rahe hain we we, we jam with chick korea Whoa. Yeah. So basically, you know, he came in, he he had said, you know, I'll 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 see how long I play, but he had indicated like 45 minutes to an hour. Mm-hmm. He went she played for almost two and a half hours. That's crazy. It was beautiful. And mics were off, eh? It was all acoustic, right? We had mic'd up everything, but it was off. It, it was all acoustic. So he played for almost two and a half hours and um after that he rested, had something to eat and then he spent like almost two hours meeting every single person that came for the show like we was just first time in india i i'm not i'm not sure okay. I, this is something i i should know the stat but i i think it was definitely his first performance ever in delhi right Or i say definitely but i i'm fairly certain about that do you have yeah. a picture of him shaking hands like people do outside their uh, restaurants you know all the big guys that came uh, in i never do that but i have pictures <laughs> of him okay taken by like one of my favorite photographers in the country Yeshu Yuvraj who captures artists like nobody else I know. Do you know Yeshu? I don't. I don't. Okay, I'll share some of the photos with you. He he's done a lot of photography uh, at Piano Man and there's just something magical about the way that he captures artists, performing artists. It's and even sportsmen like it's just he's just got a gift of making a picture talk. Yeah. I am excited to see yeah. them. what i've also noticed at the piano man is you know i'm all, i'm always a sucker for rock music because that's what i grew up on um my dad's best friend from the northeast just came one day and gave me like a pen drive and changed my life it had scorpions the eagles everything else and i never shifted back to contemporary music after that i still have mm. because my grounding was in something else so the best thing that i like about piano man among the several other things is i can go in and listen to guitar solos for free you know what i mean like good guitar solos for free and that's and and that's a huge benefit for me because usually you have to open like a concert clip on youtube and then listen to it but rue the fact that this happened many years ago and you're watching it on a screen but immersively koi banda phaad raha guitar which is like shredding and i'm like this is for free yeah. it doesn't happen in delhi where if you see the the shift has largely been to background music and deep house hmm. you know this is yeah. where venues are shifting So for me it's the last bastion where I can actually listen to legit guitar solos and not one night several nights. So I mean you know like and and then you do a wonderful thing or the band leader does a wonderful thing where they introduce every single person they have their solo 
the jam sessions are absolutely beautiful thank you yeah thank you just wanted to say that because uh just the and you know when you had sumit on with, with the band i was so surprised ki how is this rapper artist going to play with the jazz band the time signatures are different like but well no i mean no <laughs> that statement here to no. elucidate <laughs> no as in like m- most rap is written in common time signature uh uh-huh, 4 by 4 yeah and most jazz is written in common most music is written in common time signature western music derived from western classical music uh yeah i mean you come to folk music yeah it it starts moving in okay. different directions so when you say that they're written in different time signatures no they're stylistically different um yes but then over time as you've seen the you've seen that sort of that movement of you know you you are, if you have say jazz over here and hip hop over here you've got blues r&b uh soul funk you know they're sort of moving together right, and right. blending in over there in that gray space there's a playlist on spotify called jazz rap it's one of my favorite playlists yeah. that has jazz intonations with people rapping over it yeah. you know there was this one album that i had i to try to figure out where i've kept it it's it's um are you use records are you like a big vinyl guy i i i It's been a while since I've had time to sit and listen but I have I have a big collection of records like okay. between my father and I we have like some 400 odd or 800 odd records so So he he was the one who started your love for music yeah. uh, absolutely uh, yeah. my father uh, you, you see he used to head exports for Maruti for uh-huh. a very long period of time so as a result he went across the world So you we were on the fact that your father uh, so you know and I I always feel that if he had the opportunity when he was a child he might have been a sportsman or a musician because he is uh he, i mean first time i took him for golf like 15 minutes later he's hitting like 200 yards pehli baar you know um music like if he picks up the harmonica and he plays it's it's insane like i performed with he's the harmonica he's not trained no not not at all yeah but how does he know how to uh, purse the lips and do it ear training just his ears are incredible and and then he'll do what he needs to do to get the sound he wants <laughs> yeah. wow you know so he's one of, he was one of those cats so um So I like he, how you say cats so yeah. that's a jazz term. <laughs> yeah, it is. So he um he kind of traveled around the world, uh, South America, Africa, you know, far east. And one of the things that he brought back was all his music. So I grew up listening to music from literally all over the world before Napster and Kaza and now, you know, Apple Music and Spotify. So the, I'm privileged like like I said you know we 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 come from a space of privilege and this allowed me to have a f- very wide um field or understanding or not well understanding is a very big word knowledge of that ye bhi exist karta hai hmm. exposure that's the right word and he's still a gupta ji when it comes to being a gupta ji Sorry? And he's still a Gupta ji when it comes to being a Gupta ji? Dad dad is the most non Gupta ji Gupta ji. Like he's he's You're also very yeah. non Gupta ji Gupta ji. I learning from my folks only, right? They <laughs> yeah. So he's not a I mean except for the bellies. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so he um so his his uh, taste for music is super eclectic. I mean he's a classic rock head at the end of the day. Pink Floyd is god. Mm-hmm. But he also listens to everything. So I I grew up listening to say this album of cuban lullabies where i learned of bola de neve and mar patundo um and i grew up listening to uh this album called mozart l'egyptien which is um an arabic singer blended with mozart that's crazy and i grew up listening to you know um classic rock played on the you know pan flutes from the andes <laughs> so th- there's just so much musical diversity that it was hard for me i i don't think i did i had an option but to love music because right. i just grew up listening to so much of it in such diverse amounts of it or types of it and jazz for me happened um r- fairly randomly i think my my brother gave me a cd and this is actually it's, some of my written interviews also has this very specific story because everyone was like well, why do you love i listen to jazz because it's uncommon right. in india He gave me a CD of uh, Louis Armstrong playing W.C. Handy's music. W.C. Handy was like the first published blues author. Louis Armstrong is author. 
like uh, musician as well okay. but uh, like his manuscripts i think were the first blues published manuscripts available to purchase to play okay. yeah um I double check that but i'm fairly certain and uh, louis armstrong is like the ambassador of jazz right? so um the album's stunning and it kind of when i heard that sound i was like fuck me this is this is it like this is the shit mm. and that it was just like instant and from there on i started exploring the world of jazz and then learning and then playing um but that doesn't mean that i don't still love to listen to mostly everything right right so i mean i haven't been able to get my head around deep house and edm and stuff it doesn't excite me um but barring a few things here and there i i'm open to listening to everything i have a question about louis armstrong because i um i noticed that he smokes cigarettes a lot mm. right how does he no he well that was, uh, louis did oh you so, of course yeah <laughs> louis louis <laughs> 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 no the, yeah the reason so, the reason i say that is there's still a natural vibrato in his voice and i noticed that in your voice also does that happen by just do you rehearse no so i when it comes to uh so uh, L- louis used to smoke as the story say crazy amount of cigarettes right and people assume that louis grow came from like his vocal cords like getting um for me uh i have a i have a baritone naturally um how i learned to use my voice better so when i started singing with my first band the variety r like the first band for which i sang uh my my drummer who you may know nikhil vasudevan i do not okay he's a lovely guy dear friend of my old friend of mine like we're we're the the f- beginning of the new generation of jazz in in delhi you know in the early 2000s so he used to beg me not to sing he like i to please piano baje le die you mad you know <laughs> um and i i don't blame him like uh, i'm not it's not like i'm a phenom- phenomenal singer now but i was beautifully pathetic 10 years ago but uh, i had a single like maybe one or two lessons with uh there was a there was a, uh, a teacher named Christine Matovic uh i took a couple of vocal lessons with her which were more from the operatic side of things and you i can took sing the opera no i can't okay. uh i mean just technique vocal technique and then i took one or two lessons um with somebody who had come to teach at gmi julie hill back in 2016 i think and she actually i think it was just like a 1 15 minute conversation and which she's like you know what She heard me sing and she's like the problem is that you are trying to sing what you need to do is understand your voice understand your physiology so take a song that you know and don't sing it speak it in key hmm. and just keep doing that and doing that and doing that until you move to being able to sing it absolutely naturally like you would be speaking it So I tried that it took 2 3 months to understand the physical sensation of doing that and then to be able to incorporate it and immediately like a I started sounding a lot better even to my own ears and b I all this like the growl and this and that started happening without straining my vocal cords right so oh. technique is key one only has to listen to Axel Rose to see how it went wrong you know cuz his vocal uh-huh. cords are shredded no, so you know. i mean happens like even with with say king oliver who is the person who discovered louis armstrong mm-hmm. i mean he disappeared after he burst his lip what right he was from would, playing. Oh, playing yeah right so how do you burst a lip bro like uh, pata nahi ye ye phat jata hai lip andar se the, the thing inside it pata nahi matlab so for me the journey on playing the trumpet actually started in covid i bought my trumpet in 2007 in boston when uh-huh. i went for my fulbright because i love the instrument right it's my entry into jazz louis and i picked it up here and there and blew a few notes here and there and that time there was a, a lovely a british gentleman andrew uh heyman andrew heyman i think uh um 
who whose wife was working with the embassy so he was in in delhi and then there was another guy named tim who played guitar and there was so we we formed a little band and he used to andrew used to play the trumpet and he sort of gave me a few tips i mean then they left and I'm, i'm now that i'm talking about him i'm going to dig up his email and just after just so long I, yeah hey just thought of yeah. you what's up yeah you know and um but in covid is when i actually had downtime for the first time in like two decades so that's when i decided ki first day of the lockdown took out the trumpet and three hours and i did that every day yeah Ooh, i did that every day so just that brought me to a point after 15 years of wanting to play the instrument where i can play it decently play a few no no i can't play it decently i can fake it i can fake yeah. it decently wait ghar pe shank hai you know Haan. and i you, same concept yeah i i dug up a pass. youtube video by this guy who video pe demonstrate kar raha tha so khud nahi baja but after a few attempts he got it right and i started to do it i noticed ki whatever i knew about playing a wind instrument cuz typically logo experience hota hai whistle bajana wo jo whistle do apne hoto se like that right it changes when you're trying to push wind through something and then making it, trying to make it sound musical it's a lot easier to play a string instrument uh-huh. right so did did you did your did, did your lungs expand yeah i mean it's so you know i i had a really bad bout of covid in delta and the minute i recovered from it what i started doing was practicing the trumpet again and i saw that um from 3 hours of or 2 to 3 hours of rehearsal time i was down to 10 minutes and within a month i was back up to 2 and a half years mm. so it really i think it's an exercise for the lungs but beyond that also like when you talk about source of, so for wind instruments is source of sound right right in a brass instrument the source of sound are your lips in a woodwind or any reeded instrument is the reed right mm-hmm. it's what is the surface that is setting the air into oscillations right right and then you're shaping the frequency right so with 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 a shank much like a brass instrument it's like it's it's the, that's what it sounds like when yeah. i'm going to do it yeah it's the lips right and then you shape yeah. it right and then when you're playing like a reeded instrument a reeded instrument like a sax or something you know you're not you're not making the sound but you are pushing air into a reed which is then oscillating and setting the air into i had no yeah. idea i just thought they were all wind instruments yeah no so the source of sound changes like how is the air being set into vibration yeah yeah but are there so i have uh, i interviewed sarathi korwar about 2 years ago who is probably when you look up jazz in india that's the name that comes up as as someone who's taken it kind of abroad who sarathi korwar i'm embarrassed that i don't know sarathi s a r a t h y space k o r v w a r korwar ha huh? You've never he was on he was at a box out recently like a few days ago uh with his uh I'm surprised I mean I will obviously now go home and Yeah I'll send you his stuff. Yeah. So his his stuff is immaculate. So he studied uh, classical music in Pune. Hmm. Then he realized like whenever they would do whenever Indian musicians would collaborate with other musicians and try to do fusion the fusion sounded off, right? So he learned classical first and he learned jazz and then he made something called Indian jazz. Some of the covers have the Alice Coltrane versions done in a much better way some of them have live musicians jinone tabla wagera bajaya and he's like a drummer in the back then he made songs with uh, mc mawali and prabdeep where there's like crazy muted uh, trumpets going off in the background as prabdeep is rapping all over it so it's great it's great uh, a lot of it is he's got that merch that says fly immigrant you know that's kind of thing cuz he verbs south asian artists in the uk But yeah uh when i think of jazz because of my exposure to him i think of him but are there other indian jazz artists that are known that you know yourself that people can check out so yeah i mean if you're looking at indian origin artists who've sort of made it big in the world of jazz you got guys like rudresh man thappa you got vijay ayer you got so you know sharik hasan is now faculty at berkeley he's phenomenal piano player as well so there's so many um indians who've gone abroad and sort of made and guys like say rudresh mahanta part so he, he, i don't know if you've heard him 
I have not. Okay, so check he, it out. So he he blends in the the microtonal Indian sound into the jazz sort of spectrum, right? But then you got Indian artists playing more trad jazz, for example, who are in India itself, who are well, they reached a level where you can sort of pick them up and put them in any club in the world, and they sound amazing, like amazing. I'm so happy to see that because uh, the the number of jazz artists in Delhi, for example, has exploded over the last decade, right? From when I started out in 2002, two, three, there was just literally like it was tough to make a band to find like two people, right? And today, there every couple of weeks, and jam sessions are one interesting place where this happens. Musicians come, they meet each other, they'll play, they'll say, oh, I like working with you, okay, let's set up a trio or a quartet, and then newer musicians are coming in. There are two sort of critical verticals um, to building the scene. Mm-hmm. Exposure and education. They're exposure to other musicians? Exposure? exposure to- no, I'll explain in a... Exposure and education. And both apply to both musicians and audiences, right? Because exposure of a, an art form to an artist will create a demand for education for that art form. Exposure for the same art form to an audience will create a demand for the market. Mm. So it's all interlinked. Education to the audience will create a... They say a niche audience. Niche ka matlab kya hai? Niche ka matlab ki wo sp- the, it's narrow. Right. That they know what they, they specifically want that narrow field of. Right. Right. So what exposure, what education for an audience does is when they learn more about it, familiarity, uh, they say breeds contempt, but I think familiarity breeds first tolerance and then love. Mm-hmm. When you know some, if you don't know something and it's strange to you, you're like, yeah, what is you listen to it a few times, you'll be like, hmm, okay, maybe. Then you'll take out a little time to sort of understand it. And when you start understanding it, then you un- when you understand the nuances or something, then you're like, yeah, I care about this. Yeah, then you move over to the other side. Because you made the effort, right? So if, 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 you, if you meet somebody for the first time, you don't know their life, you don't know who they are. You're indifferent in a large way to the external influences on them, hmm. right? Um. And as you get to know the person, it starts becoming relevant to you on their environment. Mm. And you are more invested in the person as you would be in your friends as opposed to strangers because you know them, because you care about them, right? Right. It, it translates to art form as well. When, so taking jazz in this instance, uh, anything, hip hop, jazz. So the education of the audience will create a more knowledgeable demand. That, all right, you know, we want not jazz, we want bebop. We want this, we want that, you know. And over time, you have this small part of the audience which will keep growing, which is the educated demand. And then you have the, the exposure demand, which is shoving people in that direction. And then some of them are moving into the, right? Right. And then similarly with artists, you have the exposure creating interest. Oh man, that's also possible. Hmm. And then, and here is where we have a problem, is education. Where do they learn? They have a few, there are a few wonderful institutes in the country. In Delhi itself, you've got GMI, you've got Blue Note School of Music, Pranigurung. You know, you've got a b- other bunch of schools across the space. You've got Sam Down South, you've got KM Conservatory, you've got True School of Music. Is it sufficient for the volume of people that we have? Absolutely not. And a lot of incredibly, you know, a lot of people with incredibly high potential don't get the environment that they deserve to be able to fully utilize their potential. Mm. Going to Berkeley and studying is not an option for 99% of the people, right? It's too expensive, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's what, 80, 90 lakhs, including living costs or something, something like that per year. It's ridiculous. So it's not ridiculous in the sense that yeah, they're charging what they're charging. That's fine. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's their prerogative. It's ridiculous to expect that that can be normalized in a poor country where the median income is so far below that amount. Right. And then maybe you're not a good blues artist, but you're a fantastic jazz artist, but you don't know because you've never been exposed to it. Ex- that's, the, that's also the function of, like I said, the, the exposure and education, right? 
exposure actually helps a large way in helping people understand what they want to play mm-hmm. right because you're sampling you're tasting you t- ye main abhi dosa taste kiya abhi main vada taste karega abhi idli taste kara mere ko vada khana hai mm. right you, you you get a chance to you get exposed to these different verticals and options and then you make a conscious decision on what you prefer right and then education will allow you to it's on my vada ghar pe bana ke khaunga it's like the beatles in hamburg when they had the the hamburg years no one was listening to them but they were playing for so long that they figured out their style ki hame ye bajana hai right that wouldn't happen if they already come from home ki hum to yahi bajate hain that's often but, a limiting but factor that's that i i would separate that from both these statements and say that that is evolution so where you are open to like i said those are the iterations of system development that's right. evolution where you're doing something and you're not being closed about it you're allowing the feedback loop to function how can people sample new music then ek to ye hota hai ki i think one of the problems is that you know you you go to your spotify which is i mean i guess most people listen to music that way right or you go to a youtube recommendation and the algorithm kind of decides ki what you will like next like you know spotify pe option hota hai artists related to this more artists like this from there you go on a chain i used to do that a lot 2016 ke andar when i first started now over time this Narrower. software is is just dictating my taste it's my discover weekly it's my on repeat i'm not even thinking about it the conscious organic discovery khatam ho gayi hai this is where like live music when you come in uh, exactly that you know because but, wahan pe you can discover something but then you have to make sure you don't go for the shows that you know hmm you got to say main aaj jaunga without checking the calendar just go main aaj jaunga bring serendipity back into your lives but that's th- that's the whole point right like if you had come in yesterday for example in the piano man delhi you would have heard a trio called sas okay siddharth the sonic which would legitimately blow your mind okay right it's a guitar jazz trio playing at but guitar trio doesn't mean three guitars and it's okay for people not to not know that because i have had this question come to me twice this week which is why i'm specifying it a guitar trio means like a guitar bass and drums like backline support and i mean they're legit amazing amazing right and there there's so many other incredible artists that you don't know and you wouldn't get to know because the habit in our country in general we are surviving because the habit is not absolute <laughs> let me clarify but in general the habit is ki theek hai main isko janta hu main sumit ko janta hu hmm. sumit is beautiful i love yeah. the kid right but so main uske har show pe jaunga hmm आप जाइए प्लीज जाइए शोज आर अमेजिंग बट ऑल्सो वन डे डिसाइड किया महीने में तीन या चार बार मैं बस उठ के चले जाऊंगा जो भी बजा रहे right. अच्छा लगा अच्छा लगा नहीं लगा नहीं लगा बट एक्सपोजर मिलेगा कुछ इट्स लाइफ सैम्पलिंग यू कॉन्ट गेट दैट यू कॉन्ट लोन इन योर हाउस यू कॉन्ट या आई हैव अ स्टोरी एंड देन यू नो वी कैन रैप थिंग्स द स्टोरी इज This is actually it, it's a testament to sampling only. Me or my roommate Boston, me, we were just a little bit high, and we were walking down like there's this place called Alston Rock City. We used to run a music venue together mm. called the Garden of Alston. Really? Yeah. In Boston? In for two years. Oh damn! Underground venue huh. in our basement Achha. where uh, for, uh, rock and punk bands and ska bands from Berkeley, uh, Howard, BU, in some colleges, came and played there. We charged five dollars for entry for two years. We ran that. So. Uh, and you know bad acoustics and the bands are also learning how to so they mastered the stage presence there some of them went on to LA and became like medium level bands ye sab ho raha tha anyway we were walking on alston and like checking out a new quarter of the neighborhood that we haven't checked out and we're high as fuck so wahan pe there's this old dilapidated uh ek uh, courtyard bana hua hai it's got like a broken italian fountain hota na aise wo to wo toota hua hai and wahan pe ek purana gramophone type ka speaker rakha hua hai and you've got like this great who was it uh yeah not 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 billy uh like yaar what's his name i can for the life of me i can't remember his name uh but this fantastic artist was playing and uh uska gana chal raha tha uska andar se tooti tooti se awaaz aa rahi thi so you walked inside the courtyard and there was a door that said welcome to looney tunes records it was in the basement and it had like a poster of the beatles like a moral of the beatles some under guy this really old guy who was you know like the founder of this record shop old record shop hum i this was my first time in a record store ever in my life so i'm inside and i've you know i'm like yaar 
he's like hi how's it going and then he goes about his business i'm like mere ko records khareedne hain matlab ab mere mein ye tha ki main i have listened to rock and roll all my life i can just go and buy what i listen to on my mp3 right there is like can you help me pick five records can i be delighted to usne sab kuch choda and then he's like okay is particular record ke andar na it's actually a spoken word album about a weird bus trip that takes place in space so he got that out uh the second thing that he got out was uh this muted horn section yeah i can't remember his name not who's like a big like a great black uh trumpet or like a jazz guy beyond uh, louis armstrong it's a, i mean it's a very very open wide field are you okay. like miles davis would be the next biggest like miles davis be nahi acha theek hai when i remember it i will i will i will let you know theek hai so he picked that the third one he picked was this uh, esoteric album uh, called uh, jo belly dancers hoti hain france mein uh, them belly dancing to tablas usne okay. itni random random albums pick kari and then for for making me feel familiar he picked like a rare led zeppelin record as well and then i went back home oh and then the, the last album that he picked was weasels ate my flesh by frank zappa and uh, and the mothers of invention so i i had heard of frank zappa but i did not listen to his music i thought just ek ladka ek bandya tha badhiya sa tha i went back home purchased like a record player and then sat down and then played it and what came out just shifted my perception of ye hote hain more listening ki jahan pe ek bande i trusted a curator gave me five sounds i'm playing them and then i would start hosting these sessions where people would come and listen to the records and i don't think i would get that from spotify no matter how hard i tried no matter how hard but I that's tried. essentially what a music venue is right it's that in a slightly more structured formal frame ki yeah. matlab hum curator hain ha hamari team curator hai humne shows plan kare hain aao suno sample karo fantastic <laughs> what do you do for delhi for for india and for people who have eclectic tastes and then for people who don't have and want to find that out is amazing and uh my friends speak highly of you i love your venues you. and uh thank you for being on the show thank you so much this is great it was a yeah. lovely conversation where can people find you where can people follow all the things oh so um in- instagram yeah instagram yeah. tpm I mean, I, tpm cafes yeah i don't use it often okay. but i'm asg.tpm okay um my delhi club is tpm cafes and my gurgaon club is tpm.ggn Okay. Right. This before it became Guru Gram. We had already blocked Guru Gaon. So TPM dot GDN. Got and it. All three of them. TPM is the piano man. So TPM. And then, if people are in Delhi, they can check out the venue in Sabdarjang Market. Sabdarjang and Thirty Second Milestone in Guru Gaon. Guru Gaon. And you just go on our website, the piano man dot in. You have the calendar there, or just don't. Just come. Yeah, I think I think uh, people can do either of those. I'm going to do the latter where I just come and see what happens. Thank you, man. So it's been a pleasure. Likewise, sorry. Worries. Take care. All right, we'll see you guys next Tuesday or Friday. Don't forget to subscribe and uh, make sure you check out the Piano Man. Uh, if you're there, go say hi. Say the number sent me so I can get a free drink next time. All right, <laughs> let's go. See you. Bye bye.